book of Luke, chapter number 18. And uh, we began when we kind of hit a little bit of a random way this morning and uh, in Sunday school and in the morning, not necessarily a chronological way, but uh, we emphasize in Sunday school uh, the element where Jesus tells the disciples what it is that is about to come and what they can expect to occur here within the next uh, short little while. And the Bible teaches that the disciples didn't understand it. It was something that was hidden from them. Doesn't necessarily mean God hid it. Uh, that may very well be the case. We also find that they were personally striving for a particular throne uh, in the kingdom and the place of prominence. It may very well be that their own personal ambition was what blinded them uh, to hearing the words that Jesus had shared. Then we looked at a parable a little bit later on in the morning service that dealt with uh, the postponement of the kingdom. And that comes again a little bit later on uh, in the book of uh, Luke as well. We find that there are some opportunities and some individuals as Jesus' ministry is beginning to kind of draw to a little bit of a conclusion. And uh, whether these particular things have much to do with Palm Sunday or not, I don't know. But uh, the reality is I felt very much the Lord leading us into these areas here to look at some of the lessons that that are able to be taught specifically with Luke uh, in mind of things that are, are up and coming. Well, what we find is that there are opportunities all throughout Jesus' life to minister to people. And there are times where uh, it's interesting to note some of the responses that are actually given. For example, we find where in Luke chapter 18, there is some instruction that is given concerning the matter of prayer. We've looked at this as well in recent days where uh, men ought always to pray and not to faint according to verse 1. And then he cites a parable of a lady uh, who had a widow who needed a judgment to be passed and an unjust judge refused to hear her case. Finally, after the persistence and uh, his determination that if I don't give in to this lady, she is going to continue to annoy me, so I need to just hear the case, he finally granted her uh, what it was that she had wanted. Then he goes on and talks about a, uh, individuals who trust in themselves for righteousness, beginning in verse number 9, one is a Pharisee and one is a public, and the Pharisee stands up and prays, interestingly, according to verse number 11, with himself. That's about as far as his prayer went. Very piously, he prays in verse 11, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. <laughs> I, I can't help but I wonder what his tone was. It had to have been a pious arrogance. Did he grab his robe? I, I think he perhaps did. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Even as this guy right here. And the publican, oh, he continues on. I forgot it. he's got to commend himself. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And you guarantee, including even the spices. You remember that was something that's talked about. A tenth of his spice cabinet. And the publican standing afar off has a little bit of a different perspective. He would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And what a contrast it seemed. But then you find where there are people who are in need of Jesus. And it's interesting to note, first off, his compassion. You also find the frustration of the people who are there. It begins in verse number 15 where the Bible says, They brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. We don't know what it was and why it was that they were bringing the infants. Were they diseased? Uh, Luke's account does not give any uh, information about that. There are other passages, if I'm remembering offhand, that uh, do indicate they, were, they had various infirmities. But they bring these people to Jesus, these little children. But I want you to notice the reaction when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. And Jesus said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. 
There's one example, not the example uh, that I was planning on, on necessarily drawing attention to, but here is this individual, uh, these parents who are bringing these children, and the disciples view these people as an inconvenience. They view them as a problem. Well, I want us to drop all the way down to uh, the beginning of verse number 35. Jesus has just announced to the disciples what it is that is going to take place and what it is that's going to transpire. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain man, a blind man, sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before, notice, rebuked him. That he should hold his peace, but he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him and glorified God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. There are two other passages where we find this particular account. I would like to turn to both of them. The second one is in Matthew chapter number 20. Our time is going to be spent uh, in Luke chapter 18. But in Matthew chapter 20, verse number 29, you find that as they departed from Jericho, kind of a little bit of an interesting uh, statement. Jesus is seen in Luke as arriving in Jericho and entering Jericho. Matthew talks about him departing from Jericho. And behold, two blind men are sitting by the wayside. When they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Notice the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. You find in Matthew's account two individuals. You find in Luke's account one individual. You find in Matthew's account Jesus leaving Jericho, and Luke's account Jesus entering Jericho. I do want you to note the contrast between verse 31 and verse 34. The Bible says at the beginning of verse 31 that the multitude rebuked them. But Jesus, verse number 34, let's say it this way, loved them. What a vastly different perspective. Let's turn to Mark's account of the same story, Mark chapter 10 and verse number 46. Mark chapter 10 and verse 46, as you're turning there, there are many who will take a look at these and say, here is a contradiction between these two passages. No, not necessarily. There are some very simple ways uh, of being able to resolve it. Mark 10, verse 46, they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, arose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Wilt, wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. How do you take and reconcile two accounts that seem to have a number of contradictions? Well, it could very well be that they are two separate incidents, although I do not think that that is the case. Uh, but that is one possibility, that they are two separate incidents. It seems to me instead that Matthew, though he is focusing on there being two blind men, Mark and Luke later on focus on an individual that more than likely would become a little bit more prominent by the name of Bartimaeus. It's not to say that the other one did not also receive his sight. Matthew's account is very clear that he likewise received his sight. 
How do you take and reconcile the fact that one talks about Jesus as he is leaving Jericho and the other that talks about Jesus as he is entering Jericho? More than likely what happened was as Jesus was entering Jericho, there are a number of people and the crowds begin to follow him, probably including these two blind men. As they are going through Jericho, they are crying out, Have mercy on us, thou son of David. It did not happen, although it sounds in the English tense as though it was something that took place one time, and then they were rebuked for it. That's not the case. What happened instead is that they repeatedly cried out, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. And after a certain amount of time, individuals turned around and said, you need to be quiet. Now, consider all that is going on. In the scenario, and, and let's be in Luke's account, Luke chapter number 18, having now read uh, all of the different accounts, he is now entering into Jericho. Uh, it's not long before he is going to end up now going into Jerusalem. And as he is going here, here are individuals we know from Matthew's account that both of them are blind and they are needing the Lord. So many times we will come across individuals who the solution is the Lord. They have all sorts of problems. They may be uh, physically ill. They may have mental illness. They may have all sorts of issues. But the, the solution ultimately is these individuals need Jesus Christ. That's the reason. And as they're now entering into Jericho, this individual and the attention in Luke is drawn most likely to Bartimaeus that, Luke, uh, that Mark rather refers to. Here he hears this vast crowd coming. And he was in a position where he sat there more than likely every day. We do not know how many years he had done so. But he sat there begging. This was his only source of revenue. And as the individuals would come, he would hear uh, that naturally there were a whole lot more people coming, perhaps a lot more clamor and chatter, and he asked somebody, what is it that is coming? Why is all of the noise here? And they said, well, you know what? Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And I want you to note the faith that this man had. Jesus is passing by. Had he ever seen Jesus? No. Had he read of the prophecies? No, though he had perhaps heard them. But he recognizes that name. Jesus of Nazareth is the one who is coming by. He also recognizes that ultimately it is Jesus who is going to solve his need. And so he begins crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The title, the son of David, that Luke refers to in Luke chapter number 11, uh, Matthew's account, or I'm sorry, Mark's account also is going to hold to these titles. These are titles that say that this individual recognizes that Jesus is the actual Messiah. Though the crowds are going to, to hail him and say Hosanna here in just a very short time, there are other individuals who likewise recognize that Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of the messianic line through David and that he is the Messiah. Very interesting to note all of the faith that is wrapped up in that statement, Jesus, thou son of David, and he asks this question, have mercy on me. But yet, it seems as though, for a brief time anyway, those cries went unheeded. And so he began crying out all the more, and somebody, and we do not know who, rebuked him and said, you need to be quiet. Why? <laughs> Nobody asked that question. Well, are we having church and you can't talk? Are you, what are you disrupting? You're, you're interrupting me. We're trying to talk to him. You're annoying. You're, whatever the case may be, we don't know, but they are rebuked and told to be quiet, but it doesn't stop him. Instead, the Bible says that in verse number 39, he cried so much the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? What do you want? What is it that you are desiring? And he said, 
What's the first word? Lord, that I may receive my sight. Man, what a request. Oftentimes, we make various requests, not really anticipating the Lord will answer them. We sometimes deal with what we want to term as the impossible. He's already stated when it came to the uh, rich man that it's easier for uh, a, rich, or a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And in doing so, the disciples were amazed and asked the question, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with men this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. He realized that there is nothing too great for God. Nothing. But yet our circumstances often seem so great and so overwhelming. If you engage in any sort of ministry towards people at all, and all of us ought to be there, you will find where there are times that it honestly seems hopeless, and it seems helpless. And yes, we know that we are not supposed to give up on someone, and it's not necessarily that we are giving up on them, but we reach the point where there's nothing else that we can do. And we oftentimes then turn these things and these matters over to God. But what I want you to see is that there's nothing that is too hard for God. You realize in your own life that there is no burden that is too heavy for God. None. Now, if you try to shoulder it, you will find that there are many burdens that are far too heavy for us to handle. There are many weights on our shoulders that quite honestly we are unable to bear. And it is exactly why Peter commands us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. You take those things that you desire and you roll those things over onto the One who is able to bear them. Here is an individual who is in need of his eyesight being restored. And he hears that Jesus is passing by. This is his moment. And he seizes the opportunity that has been given him. He recognizes that Jesus is the one who is going to be able to solve the problem. He doesn't sit there and wallow in his misery and say, well, you know what? There's nothing I can do. I'm blind. It sure would be nice to see him for a change. He doesn't do any of that. But what he does is he recognizes this is the solution. This is exactly what I need. I need Jesus Christ. And he asks and he recognizes everything that is there with the claims to the, the deity and the throne of Israel. He is the Messiah. And he begs God for mercy and he does so repeatedly. The multitudes tell him to be quiet, but it doesn't stop him. He continues asking and he continues begging. And finally, Jesus came to him and said, what would you like? Man, I wonder, Lord, I want to receive my sight. I want to be able to see. I don't know if you know anyone who's been blind or not. I never have uh, known anyone personally. I've seen individuals who are. I saw one just the other day uh, up in D.C., a teenager stepping off of a, off a charter bus going to Arlington Cemetery. And I thought, boy, you know, I had an opportunity to see Arlington, and it's a it's a mind-blowing sight, one that uh, you don't just simply walk away from that the same. Imagine being blind going to it. Never seeing a sunrise and never seeing the sunset, never seeing the colors of, of the world and people's faces. Just having to imagine those things. And I would be, I think, very challenging. And I wonder how accurate their imagination would be, you know, if, if all of a sudden you know, he's picturing what a tree would look like and, and uh, then all of a sudden he gets to find out what a tree looks like. I wonder how, what it actually looked like. You've had individuals probably, if you've heard people on the radio uh, preach and so forth, and you wonder and try to envision them, and then you see them in real life, and it's like, Ah, that's not who you are, <laughs> okay? You don't look like that. I remember the first time I saw a picture of David Jeremiah, I thought, ah, 
no, 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 that's not you, okay? Uh, you look vastly different than that. And, and there, are, there are a variety of them. But imagine this man's condition. But yet he finds the answer in Jesus Christ. And he asks, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, verse number 42, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. Luke's account is vastly, um, or Luke's account takes and goes way beyond just the immediate physical needs that are met. Is his sight restored? Yes. But the faith that he has placed in Jesus Christ was saving faith. So it wasn't just a, spirit, a physical need that was met, it was also a spiritual need that was met. And the Bible says in verse number 43 of Luke 18 that immediately he received his sight. I don't know, and I've heard, thankfully, it's not had to be an experience that I've had. I've heard of individuals who've uh, had to have various eye surgeries and have patches over their eyes for days and weeks and so forth. And, and the hope is that when they open those eyes, they're able to see a little bit or see a little bit of light and all of that. But most of the cases, at least that I'm familiar with, I don't know of any where the sight was perfect right away. It took time and it was eventually perfect after time. But it took some time for it to all take place. Objects would not be clear, and they would be fuzzy and, and out of proportion and stuff like that, and maybe even colors a little bit distorted. But when this guy received his eyesight, do you think his eyesight was perfect right away? I guarantee it was. Can you imagine being that man on that day? The crowds tell you to be quiet. But you're not daunted by the crowds. You're not daunted by what they are telling you to do because you know that the answer is right there. And you continue and continue asking. And eventually Jesus turns and says, what do you want? And I don't believe he says this out of frustration. He heard the first time, I'll guarantee it. And he says, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And he says, receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he sees people. I wonder if he tried to find the guy that told him to be quiet. <laughs> you must be that guy. All right. Which one was it? <laughs> All right. What a sight. Can you imagine the first one to see Jesus Christ? Man, what an incredible picture. And immediately he received his sight. The Bible says that he followed him. Do you think that this guy struggled with the whole concept of whether or not it was worth it to follow Christ? I don't think so. I think very quickly you found him following Jesus Christ. And notice what else he was doing. Glorifying God. Praising God for the work that God had done. And all the people, when they saw it, including Grumpy Pants, who told him to be quiet, gave praise unto God. Why? They just witnessed an astounding miracle. I shared this morning that the lessons that Luke begins in Luke 13, and many of them are only found in Luke. This happens to be one uh, passage that's contained in a couple of other Scripture passages as well. These are all teaching spiritual truths. These are things that are preparing the disciples for the ministry that they're about to face. I think the biggest picture that is being taught here is that the nation of Israel was a nation that was spiritually blind. But the difference that existed between this man and the nation of Israel is a very significant difference. 
The nation of Israel was spiritually blind, but did not even know it. This man was blind, and he knew it. The nation of Israel did not know that the answer was in Christ. In fact, they saw no reason to turn to Christ for help. But this man shows a remarkable contrast in the fact that he knew the solution was in Jesus Christ. He knew that the answer was there. Christ is unable to remove the blindness from a nation that failed to recognize its need or turn to him for help. And in just a few short days, the nation of Israel is going to demonstrate their blindness to him. Luke continues on. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Verse 1 of chapter 19. He's about to go now to Jerusalem. I, like I said, I, I would love one day to go there and, and be able to, to see the Holy Land. I think it would be an amazing opportunity. Um, a cruise around all of Paul's different voyages would be fine also. We'll just maybe combine all of that, catch Rome and, and uh, break the bank and I'll work four jobs instead. But anyway, uh, then you find where Jesus goes into to, uh, Jericho. And there is a continuous ascent from Jericho to Jerusalem. Jericho is about 300 feet below sea level, below the Mediterranean, and uh, the Jerusalem is about 3,000 feet above the Mediterranean. 3,600 feet in a very short distance. It's a continuous ascent. It takes about six hours for somebody to walk. It was reasonable to stop in uh, Jericho and rest before going to Jerusalem. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and we find another individual, a man by the name of Zacchaeus. We know the song Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he, teenagers. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, and as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you calm down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house to stay. There's the song, and there's the uh, general idea of it, but there's a few more concepts that we could add to it. The city of Jericho is a city of Levitical priests and publicans. The priests you would expect as descendants from Aaron and think that if Jesus is needing a place to stay, the Messiah would naturally stay with one of them, would he not? The publicans saw this place as a phenomenal opportunity to make money. Jericho was one of the first cities that somebody would pass from the eastern side of the Jordan River on to the western side. If they're going to the Mediterranean Sea, they could go through Capernaum up, up north, or they're going to go through Jericho. This is a place to make money. There are lots of travelers, lots of businessmen. So let's go ahead and, and set up a bunch of taxes on imports and all of that. And we will make money on all of these travelers coming through. And so if you were a truck driver, this would take a scale and absolutely magnify the scales. Because when you have to go through Jericho, you're going to lose money. And this is what happens. So here comes a merchant, and he's on his way through to Jericho, and he comes across these tax collectors. They are the government officials that are out to make money. They are the IRS kinds of individuals, and they want to get every single dollar that they can. And they will lie, and they will do so deceitfully, and you know it, but there's nothing you can do about it. They've got more authority than you, and they are simply going to get your money. And they get your money and the profit that you had at one point in time had on the eastern side of the Jordan, now on the western side, you don't have. But meanwhile, you've gone ahead and filled this dirt ball's pockets with your money. We would call one of those individuals by the name of Zacchaeus. A guy who would be despised, a guy who would be 
very much hated. He was, the Bible says, the chief among the publicans. There are these dirt balls, and then there are the people who are in charge of the dirt balls. They're the dirty dirt balls, okay? They are the ones who are very extreme. And that's this guy. And then the Bible says in verse 2 that he was rich. Keep in mind, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. This was a very recent teaching. I guarantee it was still fresh in the disciples' minds. And he, verse 3, sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. Yes, he was short, and that was one of the problems. But would you let him in the front of the line? <laughs> No. Yeah, I've seen this guy before. <laughs> yeah, how about you pay me a little bit? Yeah, I'll let you up to the front of the line. How about, give me some money. And I'll, yeah, you're not getting up here. In fact, I tried to sell some stuff, and I pretty much lost all that I had. You want to see Jesus? Yeah, let me stand right here. Can you see him yet? Oh, you can't? Uh, how's that? Is that any better? Oh, let's just stretch just a little bit, just to be sure that he can't see. There's no way that their crowd is going to let him in. So he climbs, we're familiar with it, a sycamore tree, hearing that Jesus was passing that way. We've already seen in, Mark, in Matthew's account that the multitudes rebuked individuals, and Jesus loved them. We find the exact same thing in the account of Zacchaeus, and I don't have time to go through all of the details. We're familiar with much of the story. And he sees Zacchaeus. He said, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. He made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Can you imagine how that was? And it came to pass that as he was, I'm sorry, uh, verse number, where did I go? I skipped that one back. Verse number seven, when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, he was gone to be guest with a man that's a sinner. <laughs> Thank God Jesus has gone to be guests with individuals who are sinners. Because if he hadn't, you and I would today be lost in our sin. And Zacchaeus had an opportunity to host Jesus, the Messiah, for a night. I don't know what all the conversation was, but it's quite clear that Zacchaeus' life was transformed. What all was stated, I don't know. By the end of the visit, Zacchaeus said if, that I will take and restore to any man whom I have wronged four times what I have wronged them. I'll guarantee there was a list. <laughs> but Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. What a phenomenal statement that's there, and I don't have time to take care to, to deal with it in great detail. But here was this publican, despised by everyone, now put on the same level as the Jews. Why? Because of his faith. We've looked at it in the book of Romans. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This individual who was so despised by the community was loved by Jesus. The one whom society rejected was welcomed by Jesus. There's a lot of difference there. And I want us to leave on two notes tonight. One is your incredible opportunities to minister. We saw examples of people who were in need. We saw a cold-hearted response of professing followers of Jesus by telling someone who's looking for Jesus to be quiet. We find where a man who has absolutely no positive standing in society seeks Jesus. And once again, the crowds criticize Jesus for being a, 
a guest of Zacchaeus. In time you're engaged in ministry, you're going to find that you're going to have to get your sleeves, roll your sleeves up because they're going to get dirty. But the answer is in Jesus Christ. That's the answer. And the co-worker that annoys the fire out of you needs Jesus Christ. The mouth that if it's run one more time needs Jesus Christ. We can't have these kinds of responses. There are people who are hurting. Jesus Christ is the answer. The second thing I want to leave you with is what was stated in verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We're about to enter into a week in which we celebrate His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Imagine where you'd be today without the grace of God. Imagine where your life would be without salvation. I understand life has its pressures. And I understand that those things oftentimes weigh our hearts down, and I don't mean to in any way minimize those things. But I want you to look to Jesus Christ. I want you to take time this week and ponder what it is that Jesus Christ went through to save you. And then ask yourself, does He really love me that much? Absolutely. God commendeth His love. We saw it in Romans 5. God at one point in time demonstrated and continues to demonstrate His love toward us. We said it this way. He loved us then and He loves us today. Rest in the arms of Jesus. It's an amazing place to be. But you find time this week to ponder the sacrifice that was made for you most incredible the love that Jesus Christ has for us and then let's be busy directing others to him